Hi everyone, my name is André Almeida. I am a current developer at the open source consultancy Igalia. And then I'm here today to talk about uh, Linux and gaming, the road for our performance. So the first thing is that uh, unlike other uh, projects, Linux has not really a roadmap of uh, what things exactly we want to accomplish in five years or 10 years. So uh, basically, uh, people and companies are motivated to contribute to the project, to build new projects or to fix bugs. And it's uh, driven by user case. And uh, the cool thing is that the end users can take part of this as well. And uh, so different use cases uh, push Linux kernel for different changes. So for instance, cl cl cloud providers and uh, other companies like social networks, they are pushing for a better storage with uh, new file systems and a better storage stack. And Android and Chrome OS, uh, are pushing for better system responsiveness and for a better graphics stack. And embedded products push for better uh, resource utilization. So, and developers push for better tracing and debug tools. And the question is, uh, and also, uh, so all those use cases, they work together. And at the end, you have a better kernel for, uh, so those different use cases, they combine together in the end. So you have a better kernel for everyone. And uh, this is the effort of a good, uh, great community. And in the end, we have a kernel that is very versatile that can be used for all different use cases. And what does uh, gaming bring us uh, to the table? Um, so Linux gaming, uh, people have been playing on Linux for a lot of years. Uh, for a long time, mostly, the, uh, it was about running native titles uh, compiled for Linux. Uh, some parts here and there, but uh, it was an on and off effort. Uh, it was hard to deploy uh, proprietary games to Linux uh, due to the lack of uh, stable ABI, given the very different Libc, uh, Libc implementations and different Libc versions and OpenGL implementations and all sort of different, different things that we have with our Linux distros. Um, so, as of today, most of the games are developed for our Windows. And for a long time, we have uh, WebWide and play on Linux. So you can play your Windows games on Linux. Uh, back then, a lot of manual work and tweaking was necessary. You had to go into forums to uh, check out how to run your game, etc. Uh, but eventually, uh, slowly, th those things start to change. So back in the past, uh, Un the unit engine uh, released a uh, Linux version and you could uh, deploy native Linux gaming. And then Valve uh, took a step and decided to invest in this market to have uh, control of the o OS layer uh, where the, the games that they were selling would run. And they started that by releasing a uh, Shink line for Linux. <coughs> and later, a Proton, that is a tool to run uh, Windows games on Linux, combining a lot of different projects. And most recently, the Steam Deck, that is a handheld device to play games that uses Linux uh, in the backend. So Valve has been put a lot of effort and has been funding a lot of developers to make Linux a good system for gaming. Uh, so they sponsor uh, the development all, all, all around the stack. So they sponsor work on the Linux kernel, on Mesa, on Wine, JStreamer. Uh, they also sponsor a lot of work uh, on those translation layers between DirectX and Vulkan. And Proton is basically a bundle of all those projects with some extra patches for specific for gaming. Um, and the goal is to deliver the same performance or even better than to run on Linux. And on this website, you can check the status of different games, if they are uh, capable or not to run on Linux, and if you need to do something else to make it uh, run better. So the Linux gaming community is very active, and people have, uh, are very helpful to try to, to make uh, new titles run on Linux. And the most important piece of Proton is probably Wine that translates uh, Windows API calls to Linux calls. 
the, the calls that are not from Linux, uh, they no need to translate or emulate because uh, usually it's an x86 game uh, running on uh, x86 Linux. Um, the Wine uh, project needs to do a lot of black box uh, reverse engineering to figure out how to implement th those functions. Sometimes it's very easy to, to implement uh, a Windows function to Linux, but sometimes needs a lot of user space workaround. So for instance, this is uh, on Windows, you have uh, API call to carry for the system time. And Wine you just do a clock get time and then convert from uh, the U Unix uh, timestamp to a Windows timestamp. So it's easy. But uh, our, there are cases that are more complex. So nowadays, Linux kernel has a lot of gaming workloads, and let's see what, what problems it exposes. Um, so a lot of the work here uh, was done by different companies, including Galia, and this is a known exhaustive list, but I did my best effort to include uh, all the work and to list correctly all the authors. So the first and uh, quite controversial uh, work that was done on the kernel for Linux gaming was to have case insensitive file systems. Uh, because those games are, they are, uh, were aimed for Windows, and usually you expect that the game on, on Windows would run on NTFS, that is case insensitive, uh, but Linux is not. So uh, maybe the game was trying to look for a file uh, with uh, a different uh, case, and for the, 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 the game was not doing anything wrong, because this is how it used to work. Uh, but if th this game would, was running in an x 4 um, file system, it would fail to find the file. And uh, to work around that on Wine was very expensive because you need to try a lot of uh, uh, basically all the case combinations or we need to, to map the file system and to do a, uh, a user space cache uh, to resolve those file names. And the current solution was uh, very a way better on performance because once you create a file on an x4 uh, case insensitive folder, it will basically uh, save this, uh, this file with the name that was created, but on every lookup, both the file on the file system and the file that has, is looking for, they will be normalized to uh, the same name. So now it's very uh, easy to, to retrieve case sensitive files. Uh, initially, that was done for XC4, but um, it was also useful for Android, so it was uh, this Unicode new subsystem was also used for F2FS, and that is work in progress to, for uh, BcacheFS and TempFS. So this Unicode um, file system, uh, subsystem was created by Gabriel Crisma. Uh, also on the storage, uh, we have ButterFS. So uh, ButterFS identifies a file system by its FSID, that I think is like a, a hash of the file system. And it's not possible to mount two file systems with the same ID. Uh, but uh, for the syndac, we, uh, they use the AB partition system. So uh, not unlikely they would have the same uh, two identical file systems on, around, and they would like to mount both. So Guilherme uh, added a new feature called temp FSID that assign a random FSID to the file systems, so they can, so now you can mount two two file systems with the same uh, the same content. And now Futex. So uh, the Windows games they really like to call this function for some reason. They wait for multiple objects. And initially we mapped we mapped this to use event FD. Uh, because on EventFD you can uh, like wait on multiple files, but EventFD proved to not scale well uh, with a lot of waiters. And Futex is like a, a natural solution for implement locking on the um, on Linux, uh, but only supported one Futex per call. So uh, I initially uh, submitted uh, a new operation to Futex, but Futex was complex enough. Uh, it had so many things going around. It, uh, it was a multiplex in Cisco. Uh, so uh, the maintainers asked it to create a new API for Futex, like a Futex 2 API. 
that would address uh, all those different problems at once. So uh, after some plumbers conf after some, some plumber sessions, uh, we managed to have a new Futex API uh, that would address uh, NUMA awareness, multiple size Futexes, and of course, uh, the ability to wage on multiple Futexes. Uh, and this benefits games and other workloads like servers with the NUMA awareness uh, API. This was done by me, Peter, and Thomas. And also, uh, another feature that was added, it's called, uh, this is called User Dispatch. So usually games, uh, Windows games, they call um, syscalls using the Windows API wrappers, like we do with GDBC. Uh, but uh, it is very easy to translate, because the wine can easily hook up uh, the, the syscalls and translate. Uh, but some, for some reasons, uh, some games would call in, would uh, we're calling the syscalls directly in assembly. And, and you can see that how that can go wrong because, uh, for instance, uh, 202 syscall uh, on Windows means something, but on Linux it can, be, can mean something completely different. Uh, they don't even share uh, the same set of syscalls. And so a new uh, process control was added. It was called set syscall user dispatch that it basically what does is that uh, you define an address range where every syscall will not go in direct to the kernel, it will go first to user space, so user space can uh, translate as it wants, and then uh, maybe can call the appropriate Linux syscall. Uh, this is also useful for the sh a checkpoint restore in user space project, and it was also done by Gabriel Klisma. Uh, another thing that was improved because of gaming is the HID throughput. So virtual uh, VR uh, gaming requires a lot of peripherals. So probably uh, you have two controls and a lot of sensors and the headset, uh, a lot of devices that are, are exposed as HID. And uh, only one mutex was protecting the whole HID uh, device table. So for every operation, uh, that you want to, 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 to do, you would need to wait uh, for this mutex to do every IO controls. Um, so only one um, HID IO control was uh, permitted per time. And uh, I replaced it with a read-write lock and uh, it got almost four, four times faster. Uh, it was a very simple patch. Uh, but uh, this really helped uh, on the frame rate for VR gaming. Also, uh, we have the split lock detector handling. So x86 support atomic operations in more than one cache line. Uh, but this is uh, quite problematic because you need, to, you need to lock the bus during the whole operation. And unprivileged apps could do a denial of service of a machine by doing this. So you could uh, write uh, a code that has the split lock and send to a server, and the server would hang up. Um, so for security reasons, Linux then added a delay to every app that wanted to do a split lock. So just this app would be uh, slowed down, but not the whole system. And of course, um, some games use this feature. Why not? And, uh, it, and people will start noticing like, wait, uh, what happened? My game is running so slow after this new kernel release. And we, uh, we figured out that uh, this was because they split lock. And Guilherme uh, added a new sys control option to disable this mitigation. So if you want to play God of War on Linux, you need to do that. Uh, so this is more a research project. So uh, last year, Steve gave me the idea of how to correctly implement uh, adaptive spin locks on user space. Because um, as you know, to, to correctly have spin locks, you need to have some awareness of uh, the task scatter. Because uh, it can happen that you spin for something that is need not even happening. You should just spin if you know that the lock owner is working so you can fastly take the lock. Otherwise, you uh, can just, you may be just uh, wasting CPU cycles. So, uh, and 
so Shiv gave it this idea of how could uh, how we could have uh, adaptive sp uh, spin locks. Uh, but the problem was how do we know that uh, the lock holder was running or not? So uh, Jonathan gave an idea to use restartable sequences and it seems it's a very good match for this case. So we can uh, very easily uh, change uh, RSEC to have uh, a new field uh, telling the user space if, the, if the, uh, some thread is running or not. Uh, we're not sure yet about the, the results of this. This is still ongoing. But uh, we believe that this will benefit a lot, a lot of workloads because something similar was done in, in the past in the kernel to have those, um, uh, to have adaptive spin locks in the mutexes. So let's see. Probably this uh, will benefit a lot, a lot of workloads, including games. And this is a working process. Uh, progress done by D, my me, and Matthew. Um, so we also have uh, the page map scan. So games use uh, get right watch from the Windows API to check if uh, to check for uh, for a lot of things, and one of the things is to check if the player has modified the memory of the game. Uh, Linux software mechanism isn't so precise and fast as the Windows one. So uh, every time a game calls that, uh, it calls it a, a small delay on Linux, but not on Windows. Um, and also, uh, merge of fades and M protect calls can create false positives. So uh, Uzama is creating a new UI control called map, uh, page map scan to walk on a selected range of pages and ask if it it was written or not. And this is also useful for garbage collectors, emulators, and again for the uh, checkpoint and restore in user space. Um, so we're going to have a talk about this uh, tomorrow by Guilherme. So, but just uh, give you a summary. Uh, so now that, that we have the Steam Deck, whenever a game crashes the kernel, uh, we would like to get as many information as possible and send uh, to, to the kernel developers of the Steam Deck to figure out what's going on. But uh, it's kind of tricky to do that. We have KDump, we have PStore, and uh, uh, Guilherme is trying to figure out uh, which is the best solution for this. And uh, we don't have uh, frame buffers on after a, a, a graphic crash as well, so it's hard to notify the, uh, the user what's going on. But anyway, Guilherme will talk more about that tomorrow. Uh, on the task scatter side, uh, for some years, uh, some people have developing out of three scatterers, and uh, some research is, uh, and some of those scatterers uh, had a good performance on uh, gaming. So some research is going on to figure out uh, why they, they had good performance and what could, cha could be changed on the mainline scatter, but this is still uh, research. Uh, Color on Linux is very, uh, very complicated topic. People have been trying to implement high dynamic range for years on Linux, uh, but uh, it's very hard to to get uh, into a common API. So uh, Melissa, Joshua, and Harry uh, they working together to have uh, color API specific for AMD GPUs because uh, the AMD GPU that uh, we have on the Steam Deck has uh, a lot of color transformation features that were not being exposed by the Linux kernel. Uh, so basically with this work, uh, now we can have high dynamic range in content on the Steam Deck. And uh, uh, you can run the Steam Deck with an upstream kernel because uh, all the device drivers are upstream. And uh, all those projects that I, uh, that I, that I did, uh, not just Linux kernel, but also Wine, Mesa, and JStreamer, uh, we all work in an upstream first approach. Um, so most of the work on the Steam Deck is already upstreamable, uh, upstream, and we are working hard to get the rest of upstream as well. And uh, the Steam Deck uh, exposed uh, the AMD GPU to a lot of um, new game loads. And uh, so we, we have done a lot of fixes for the AMD GPU driver because of that. And another work that uh, another thing that I'm working on is the, how to recover from GPU resets because GPUs are very complex, 
and we uh, as now we, we don't have uh, a standardization on what we do after the GPU crashes. This is something that each driver implements on their own. And there's no DRM API to tell from the kernel space to user space that a reset happened. And, and it's very hard to collect uh, an error details from the GPU. So the first thing that I'm working on here is to uh, write a kernel doc to standardize all of this, all of the expectations of for uh, kernel driver developers. Uh, what should they do? Uh, how, how should they implement the GPU reset handling on the kernel side? Um, <clears throat> another thing that I'm working on is to enable a sync page flips in Atomic API. So uh, in the legacy DRM API, we already have support for uh, flipping pages uh, asynchronously. And now I'm extending that for the Atomic API together with Simon. So uh, basically this is it. This is all the work that I, that I managed to collect about the, uh, that was motivated by gaming. But as you can see, uh, this is something that I think happens on Linux quite often. You go there to fix a problem, people say, hey, but could you please have a look on that as well? Uh, so gaming has, uh, so this effort has been very beneficial for gaming, of course, but uh, a lot of, also for the Linux desktop in general, and uh, as you can see for other projects. So this is from my side, thank you. Just uh, FYI, I'm going to be talking about the BPF scheduler stuff tomorrow for those who are interested. Um, but it's crazy how, how much faster some games perform on Windows just because of the scheduler. Like I think Factorio on the um, AMD 7950XD, which has a 3D V cache sitting on top of one of the two CCXs with the L3 cache, it has more cache so you can have better memory locality, but you, you, have, to thermal, you have to do thermal throttling more aggressively because the V cache sits on top of the cores. <laughs> and so, um, it performs much better on Windows for that architecture because they designed it for Windows. So definitely very excited to see what we can do on the scheduler side um, for gaming. Yeah, exactly. Um, so most of, uh, yeah, this, nowadays we have the, these new challenges of how to uh, trace and uh, games because this is not something that most kernel developers are used to do, I believe. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, th those games are posing a new challenge for us, and uh, there's a lot of research on how we can make it better. Chief? Uh, yeah, we, we need to definitely uh, talk to each other because this is exactly what we're doing at Chrome OS. Ah. Um, and if there's videos online, OSPM, we gave a bunch of benchmarks about different various kernel scheduling. And one thing I've been pushing is the fact that we need a quality of service type of uh, way of telling the scheduler uh, how to run things. Because I've given a talk here about, you know, you know, who needs real, or what, real-time Linux, who needs it, not you? Well, what we really need is soft real-time, and we don't seem to have that, which is a quality of service thing, I think, that would help with um, various things like gaming, production, and stuff like that, to say, to be, we, we don't need hard real-time, which I think the Linux kernel does really, really well, but in saying, like, some things, hey, we want the uh, benefits of real-time, but if we don't have the bandwidth, you know, Okay, we fail, but we'll continue on. We'll just degra uh, degradation instead of failure. Just wondering, are any games running faster on Linux than Windows? Yes. Um, awesome. I don't remember, I think it's Cyberpunk, maybe. Uh, but yeah, some games perform faster on um, Linux than Windows. And another very strange thing, is that, uh, as I said before, we have translations layer to translate from DirectX to Vulkan, and the software can be run on Windows as well. And sometimes, if you translate DirectX to Vulkan on Windows, even with the overhead of translation, the Vulkan drivers are so better than the DirectX that they run faster as well. Uh, on one of your earlier slides, you talked about how ext4 and ButterFS have been getting uh, case-insensitive support. Uh, you didn't mention XFS, and I think the reason you didn't mention it is that XFS has had that feature since 2014. Sorry, which one? XFS. Ah, okay. Sorry, sorry. Cool. 
Um, about the adaptive spin locks, is that a feature that you already have in uh, Windows with create a critical section or how does it fit in uh, here? So, so the question if is the if, adaptive uh, spin locks, do you already have that in Windows with create critical section or how or why do you are you working on that in particular? Okay, uh, so the question is if, if Windows already have uh, adaptive spin locks, right? Uh, not, I don't know actually, and I work on, on this because of Steve. <laughs> and uh, uh, this could be a, a um, this is like a research project to see if we can uh, speed up new taxes on Linux in general. Uh, so we ha we have this uh, idea of uh, writing adaptive new taxes. Uh, sorry, spin locks, and uh, we are going to apply that to uh, GDBC pre-threads to see what happens. So I work on that basically because this could uh, speed up boot taxes, and this is something that games, not only games, but also games rely on uh, to run. So maybe we can uh, get some frame rate with that. Okay, thank you. Here. What? <laughs> Uh, have you tried to do that uh, adaptive spinning in the kernel in the few Texas call? Um, because no, that would the, be the first place to do it. But uh, how would you identify who is the log owner? Uh, you need a robust few ticks anyway to know who the log owner is. And the robust few ticks gives you the TID in the, in the few ticks itself. Okay, we didn't. Ha uh, we haven't tried to to do that with. Uh, I think I suggested sports. that to the database people many many moons ago, <laughs> and they said, "Oh no, we are so better off with our user space spin locks, which <laughs> occasionally lock up the system completely." Um, yeah, I mean, database people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but. This would be worthwhile just to try because it avoids, in the kernel you immediately have access to the, to the, to the, all the information. Yeah. And I'm, I skimmed that conversation between you and Matthew uh, and I think there are big holes in there how to utilize ERSEC uh, reliably for that. I'm not seeing it really, really working. Uh, why not? There's too many, too many race conditions there to cover. You, you overspin, um, which might be okay, but uh, whether it's a good idea, I don't know. Because if you overspin, uh, then you hold other uh, tasks off of the TPU. Yeah. Um, I think. yeah. Uh, the reason why this came up is because I had a really long conversation with the Postgres maintainer. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, but the whole thing is, he said, a system call is way too expensive. Once you make the system call, it's like, that's why they were doing user space bin locks. Because as soon as you go do the system call, that takes a lot longer. <laughs> that's the whole purpose of the whole thing. So. That has been true 20 years ago. That argument doesn't count anymore. Wait, wait. Except you, except if you have PTI or it something like more. that. <laughs> it, it counts more now because of Spectre and Meltdown. Oh. <laughs> no, and yes, I had this conversation like yeah. in 2008. <laughs> but, oh, you, oh no, I just want to grab you. Oh. <laughs> Anyone else? Cool. Thank you.